We previously examined how Venn diagrams use overlapping circles to illustrate how variables can share variance. We left off with a multiple regression analysis in which the number of hours a student studied and the rating of a, the quality of their school served as predictors of student grades. Specifically, we were wondering what to do with the variance represented in the area C here that reflects the, the variance in the outcome that's related to both of our predictors which variable should get credit for that effect, or maybe neither of them should. In future videos, we'll explore ways of answering this question, but for now, at a minimum, you should recognize that <laughs> this creates a problem, an ambiguity in our results and in our interpretation. So let's dig into this a little more. For example, because of possible overlapping C variants, the R squareds for each individual predictor don't necessarily add up to the total R squared that we would see in a multiple regression analysis with both predictors. You can see it here. The uh, R squared for grades with study hours as the predictor is A plus C, and the R squared for grades with school quality as the predictor is B plus C. If we add them together, we're going to count C twice. So you typically can't just add up individual R squareds with the outcome to get the total R squared based on multiple predictors because you'll end up counting some of the variants twice. But there is a special situation in which they do add up. Do you see what that might be? It's when C equals zero. You can write that as capital R squared only equals lowercase r squared y1 plus r squared y2 if C equals zero. Now, R squared Y1 is just a shorthand way of saying the squared correlation between the outcome Y and X1, our first predictor variable. And R squared Y2 is the squared correlation between our outcome Y and X2, our second predictor. Notice the capital R squared for the R squared in multiple regression with two predictors and our lowercase r squared for the two simple correlations. If there is no c, then you don't count it twice, and the two individual r squareds add up to the total multiple r squared. Now, visually, what would it look like if we still had both predictors, but there was no c, no variance shared by grades and study hours and school quality. It would look like this. Notice that study hours is still correlated with grades. We still have the variance A, which reflects their shared variance. Also, school quality still shares variance with grades. That's the B variance. But there's no variance in grades that's simultaneously shared by both study hours and school quality. Now, this diagram tells us a couple of important things. First, the fact that study hours and school quality don't overlap at all means they're uncorrelated. And second, what happens to the effect of study hours if we add or drop school quality from the model? In other words, what would happen to A if we have school quality in the model or we don't have school quality in the model? Nothing happens. The effect of one variable doesn't change at all when we add or drop variables that are uncorrelated with it. And it's not just the effect in terms of variance. Think about it. If the effect doesn't change, 
then the effect doesn't change. It doesn't matter whether we describe the effect in terms of variance or unstandardized regression coefficients or standardized regression coefficients. It doesn't change. We can see this mathematically in the formula for the standardized regression coefficient in multiple regression with two predictors. Remember that in simple regression, when we only had a single predictor, the standardized regression coefficient was equal to the correlation between our predictor and the outcome. With two predictors, it's more complicated. If I have two predictors, say x1 and x2, the formula for the standardized regression coefficient for x1 is the correlation between y and x1 minus the product of the correlation between y and x2 times the correlation between x1 and x2, all of that divided by 1 minus the correlation between x1 and x2 squared. If my predictors are correlated, right, the degree to which they're correlated are, will impact both my numerator, right, and my denominator. As a result, the value of the regression coefficient will change. You can think of this as the impact of losing the credit for that overlapping C variance. Because remember, the regression coefficient is the effect for x1 controlling for the other variables in the model. It reflects that unique part of the variance in the Venn diagram that's only shared between x1 and our outcome. But what happens if x1 and x2 are uncorrelated? Well, in that case, the correlation between x1 and x2 in the numerator becomes zero. And that squared correlation between x1 and x2 in the denominator becomes zero as well. So that gives us the correlation between y and x1 divided by 1, or just the correlation between y and x1. It's exactly the same as in simple regression. This shows mathematically what we just saw visually in the Venn diagram. Adding uncorrelated predictors has no impact on effects, whether we measure effects in terms of variance or in terms of regression coefficients. What this tells us, to paraphrase Martha Stewart, is that having uncorrelated predictors is a very good thing. We'll see later that when predictors are correlated, different researchers may draw different conclusions about the size or impact of a variable based on what they did or did not include in their regression model. It's the whole C problem, which variable gets credit for overlapping variance due to correlated predictors, or maybe none get credit for it. Again, more on that later. But that's not a problem when a variable is uncorrelated with other predictors. There is no C variance to debate over. Adding or not adding uncorrelated predictors has no impact on the size of the effect. <laughs> Sweet. So in practice, how do you end up with a variable being uncorrelated with other predictors? Random assignment. That's why we like random assignment so much. Now, let's say I want to test the effect of a new math program, but I don't randomly assign students. In that case, teachers may, understandably, put kids struggling in math into the new program, making prior math performance correlated with participation. Also, uh, more engaged parents may hear about this and push to have their child in the new program, making parent engagement correlated with participation. So if I end up finding an effect for the program, 
Some of that may be due to the fact that, well, these were struggling students to begin with, and some of it may be due to parent engagement. (laughs) Worse yet, some of the effect may be due to things outside my model, things for which I don't even have data. For example, maybe a lot of the effect is due to parent education, but I don't have any data on parent education. Then I'm really stuck. I can't statistically control for parent education because I don't know how much it overlaps with participation. Statistical control only works for variables in my model. (laughs) That's important. Let's repeat it. Statistical control only works for variables in my model. But if I randomly assign students to the program, prior knowledge, parent engagement, and all of the other predictors will now be uncorrelated, on average, with participation in the program. Now, what's really cool is that even applies to variables not in my model. Yes, yes. On average, even things not in my analysis, even things I have no data on or or didn't even consider when I was designing the study, will be uncorrelated with a randomly assigned variable. So what if I have no data on parent education, in a, but I've randomly assigned? Well, then it's, <laughs> it's no problem. Random assignments should make it uncorrelated with participation. What if I have no data on family income or home environment? or parenting, or how much the kid watches TV, or family stress, anything. Not a problem, because it should be uncorrelated. (laughs) Wow, isn't that cool? As a result, the size of the effect for a randomly assigned variable is not impacted by what I have or I don't have in my analysis. In research, it's kind of like the ultimate get-out-of-jail-free card. Because I don't need to worry about how it may overlap with other variables, I have a great deal of confidence that the effect I see for randomly assigned variables is the true effect for that variable. And that's a big distinction. That's a, a huge distinction between experimental control and statistical control. Statistical control tries to do this mathematically by adjusting variables, but it only adjusts for those variables in my analysis. If my analysis is missing a key variable that would change the results, well, that's a problem. The size of the effect will change based on which variables are or are not in my analysis. Consequently, the degree to which I have confidence that the effect I see is the true effect depends entirely on how good my statistical model is. That's why experimental control and random assignment is superior to statistical control. The results are are more straightforward and more definitive than statistical control in which I have to mathematically remove that overlapping C variance between our predictors. Now, look, I, I love statistical control and I use it all the time. Most of what I do can't be randomly assigned. I mean, I can't randomly assign babies into a hearing loss or no hearing loss condition. But That doesn't mean I don't recognize the power of an experimental uh, design. I don't, I I recognize, I respect, I I love that that power of experimental control. And I, I have to tip my academician's hat to those studies that can and do use it. So let's wrap up our discussion of Venn diagrams here. Now, of course, they don't work that well with more than a couple of variables, but they do provide a nice visual tool 
that can help us understand issues around overlapping variance and statistical control. Okay? Bye for now.